Welcome, everyone. My name is Chantal Lincoln, the Deputy Director for Drug Free America Foundation. On behalf of the World Federation Against Drugs and WFAD's Global Gender Committee, it is my great privilege to welcome you to this global webinar titled Call for Action, Advancing Trauma-Informed Substance Use Disorder Services as part of our observance of Orange Day 2024. Today, we gather to address a critical issue at the intersection of public health, gender equality, and human rights, the need to integrate trauma-informed approaches into substance use disorder services, particularly in the context of gender-based violence. Trauma and substance use disorders often intersect in deeply impactful ways. Studies have shown that individuals, particularly women and girls who have experienced trauma or violence are at a significantly higher risk of developing substance use disorders. Yet, Many treatment centers around the world still fail to recognize and address the role that trauma plays in the lives of those they serve. Without trauma-sensitive care, we risk perpetrating cycles of harm and making recovery an even greater challenge. Today's webinar is a call to action. It is an opportunity to reimagine treatment as a system that prioritizes well-being, dignity, and empowerment. This means not only understanding the profound impact of trauma, but also creating services that are safe, supportive, and sensitive to the unique needs of survivors, especially those affected by gender-based violence. Trauma-informed care is not, just, is not just good practice, it is a human right. As this webinar is a call to action, I encourage all participants to actively engage in today's discussions, share your questions, insights and experiences as together we can create a platform for global collaboration and innovation. Let this webinar be the start of a stronger unified effort to advance trauma-informed services worldwide and ensure that every individual seeking recovery receives the care and respect that they deserve. We are honored to be joined by a distinguished panel of experts from organizations such as the UNODC, ISIP, the Global Women's Network, and WFAD's Global Gender Committee, which I am proud to be part of. Our esteemed speakers bring with them a wealth of knowledge and frontline experience. Their insights into best practices, innovative models, and collaborative stra strategies will inspire and equip us all to take meaningful action. Since I spoke about the Global Gender Committee, let me introduce you to it. Global Gender Committee is formerly known as WFAD's Gender Working Group that was established in 2020 as part of the adoption of WFAD's 10-year strategic plan by its Congress in that same year. The reason for its establishment rooted in the map lack in gender-sensitive research as well as barriers and apparent stigma faced by women and its continuous need for it to be addressed. We consist of almost 20 representatives from organizations around the world, including India, Turkey, Argentina, South Africa, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Sweden, Pakistan, Nigeria, Kenya, United States of America, and Italy. As a committee, we partake in international events, such as the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, and organized activities. These activities are diverse and include statements, which we produce on international days throughout the years, for example, on International Women's Day and 16 Days of Activism. So please keep an eye out for our upcoming campaign on social media. We also have webinars. Besides today's webinar, we have organized several over the years, as well as capacity strengthening training on women's rights and needs, providing a flat platform for women's voices, highlighting their needs and evidence-based sensitive tools. We also do publications, Considering the importance of easily accessible evidence-based material, we have developed two position papers on prevention and treatment and recovery sensitive to gender. We also published a way forward together with Dinova International, providing a guidance in reducing barriers in treatment for women. As science continues to evolve, our reports still showcase a growing lack of sensitized services. We have updated two position papers from 2022 with added insights, including example, trauma and intersectionality. These papers are an easy tool to expand the knowledge on the issue and to integrate necessary sensitized aspects in your services. They'll be available from today onwards. We encourage you to visit our website to gain access. So before we begin hearing from our esteemed speakers, let's cover a few housekeeping items. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box Put your name, where you're from, and what organization you're associated with. Throughout today's session, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box so I can easily address them during the designated Q&A periods. 
We'll have a Q&A session following the panel discussion and another at the end of the webinar. Please engage with our panelists by typing your insights and experiences within the chat box. Now, let's move forward with our esteemed panel. We are honored to be joined today by Rocio Suarez Ordonez. She is a psychologist, chair of membership and innovation of the Global Women's Network for providers of women's substance use disorder treatment and recovery, and a consultant at the University of North Carolina Women's Health Research Center. Rocio is joined with Joanna Travis Roberts, the chief executive of ICEP. Joanna has worked in the substance use disorder field since 2001 in a variety of capacities. Her educational background is around literature and languages with a postgraduate specialism in marketing. Her professional life has encompassed a wide range of responsibilities around research, communications, event management, and leadership. As ICEP's chief executive, Joanna has made it her mission to ensure the smooth communication of effective practice and knowledge to the drug demand reduction workforce. We are also joined with Anya Bute, Program Officer at UNODC for PTRF. Coordinate, she coordinates UNODC's global project on drug de dependence treatment and care, including the UNODC WHO Program on Drug Dependence Treatment and Care as part of UNODC's Prevention, Treatment, and Rehabilitation section. The Global Projects on Treatment of Drug Use Disorders supports UN member states in all regions and their efforts to improve accessibility and quality of drug use disorder treatment and care services through technical assistance on the development of data collection systems, service improvement, capacity building, and policy development. Anya has further contributed to the development and dissemination of numerous UNODC technical guidance documents, including the UNODC WHO International Standards for the Treatment of Drug Use Disorders and the UNODC WHO Handbook on Treatment and Care for People with Drug Use Disorders in Contact with the Criminal Justice System, Alternatives to Conviction or Punishment. The discussion paper, Treatment of Stimulant Disorders, Current Practices and Promising Perspectives, and currently, Anya is leading UNODC's new initiative, Hashtag Scale Up, to explore and implement scalable interventions for the treatment and care of stimulant use disorders. Welcome, Rocio, Joanna, and Anya. Hi, everyone. Thank well, you. Chantal. Thank you. Thank you. Chantal, thank you very much uh, for this introduction. So uh, I have to be honest, we thought a lot about this webinar. And this is a call to action, as Chantal says, and it has a very clear goal. It's to provide trauma-informed care in, globally in every treatment for substance use disorders in the world. But we know that to achieve this, we need to change the narrative. The narrative about what? About gender violence and about trauma, because it's still surrounded by stigma. It's still think it's something ethereal and it still think that it is something psychological and will pass eventually. And in this, I have to say, Anya, you inspire me because a month ago you uh, presented Scale Up and you gave me a booklet. And in that booklet, I read it and it had a subtitle that said, Substance Use Disorders and the Brain. And I said, yes, this is it. How can we change the narrative? And this is it. Because if we think what actually changed the narrative for treating substance use disorders, it wasn't biology and neurobiology and neuroscience said, we have the proof. Substance use disorders rewires the brain. It's a disorder of the brain. And that gave place to what? Better treatments, evidence-based treatments, and also, make us think as the, towards the people that use drugs, not as a moral problem, not as a willing problem, but a, as a health issue. And this is a change of narrative we are doing today. Trauma, it's also a health issue, and it's very much real in everyone's brain. So buckle up, because here we go. Let me present. Do you see my screen all black? Yes? Okay. So to start and to just... It's not ask yet in presentation mode, so we still see the slide layout in case. You do? I, I just see everything black. 
Do you see everything black? No? Let's see again. Let's try again. What about now? No. No, we can oh, see but... it, right? So, but we also see the coming slides already. Okay, let's see now. Let's see. What about now? No? It's still the same. Oh. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to fix it. So can we can we do it this way? It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. okay. So let's start. Okay, let's start. So uh let's put some that's some some points very important. Why are we here? And let's look at this. One in three women had experienced physical or sexual abuse in her lifetime. We need to we need a few minutes to uh sing that in. 25% of girls experience sexual abuse during childhood. 25% of girls worldwide. And we know that sexual abuse is the most common trauma for women. Uh, when women experience PTSD, we have more than two or three times more probability than men. Men develop PTSD between five and 6%, and we between 10 and 12%. And between 75% and 99%, and I would say 100% of women in treatment for substance use disorders report experiencing trauma. So what do we think about these numbers? A huge, right? So I can't think of a better hashtag from, of the UN for this year. We have absolutely no excuse to act further. So I'm not gonna share with you what is trauma. I'm going to share what is being traumatized. And this is, I'm going to read it to you so it sinks in. Oh, sorry. Being traumatized means continue to organize your life as if the trauma were still going on, unchanged and immutable, as every new encounter or event is contaminated by the past. And this is what it is to be traumatized. And we know this has a correlation in the brain and in the body. So let's talk about trauma and the brain. The most important thing is that the brain rewires after a traumatic experience. We have a lot of neural connections and after a traumatic experience, they rewire again. And what they do is, to, is they organize everything the world and ourselves. It changed the perceptions we have of ourselves. So Rousseau, every time, sorry, yes. Rousseau, the slides didn't advance for us. We're still on the black slide, so we can't really? see your brain slide. I'm afraid. Maybe there's. Do you have two screens? Maybe we're seeing your other screen. Oh, this is so bad. Let's see. I'm sorry. Which we 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 did this. Okay, what I'm gonna do, what can I do? If you wanna send me a let's question see. now with your PowerPoint, I can also share it on my end. Oh, let's see, let's see, let's see now. No, that's the same. That's Which, the same. Do you, you, wanna, to... do you wanna share it, Joanna, that you have it? Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, do you want me to try? Yeah, can you do it? I'm sorry. How does that look for everybody? Perfect. Much better. Better? Okay. Carry on. I'm sorry. sorry. Jumping in. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. So we were in how trauma rewires the brain, right? Um, and it means that everything, every connection that we have in the brain that make us perceive the world in a certain way, it changes. So every time I train this, uh, with in, in a conference or in training, I use this and I do this. Can you see me? I'm wearing black glasses. Okay, of course, Joanna is gonna laugh because she always laughs with me. But this is what I do. And everyone's do the same as Joanna is doing. Everyone just starts looking at each other and saying, what is happening? Why is this person indoors just using sunglasses? 
But to be honest, this is the best way I found to just portray what changes, the perception that changes when you are traumatized. Uh, the color of the world, is, it's darker and everything changes. And we all use sunglasses. So this is the best way I can think to portray how traumatized people see the world. And I'm going to ask now, Joanna and Anya, have you ever been in a situation that was so emotional or you were so upset that you said to yourself, I, I don't know, I just, I just can't think straight. I just, this is too much. And after the situation happened, you look and say, yeah, I should have done X or Y. Do you feel it? Do you know? Yeah. Do you know the yeah. feeling? Horrible feeling. Horrible and it's worse. Feeling, yeah. Horrible feeling. And it's worse when you tell somebody and they say, hey, why didn't you act X or Y? But it's worse. Yeah. So I want to explain why this happens. And I want to put you in the, in the head of someone that experienced, for example, a sexual assault. So our brain, it's wired to one thing, to make us live, to survive. So when we are in a threatening situation, we, have, we receive a stimuli that is threatening. One part of our brain, that is the amygdala, just looks and says, whoa, 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 this is threatening. So we need to prepare to fight or flight. In this preparing to fight or flight, what happens is all the blood goes to the muscles and to the parts of the brain that actually are going to say, okay, we're going to survive. So, but there's a part of the brain that does not get enough blood flow. Can you think what it is? It's this one. It's the prefrontal cortex. It's the one that makes us think and say, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. Let's don't, re they don't react. Let's respond. That is why we cannot think straight when something happens. The good thing is that this is supposed to, to, uh, to last a couple of minutes because we are supposed to survive. And what I'm going to say, it's one of the most important predictions to know if a traumatic experience is going to have long lasting effects. When we are held down, for example, in a sexual assault, when we are captive, when we are locked, for example, in uh, domestic violence, can we defend ourselves? Can we actually put a, an end to the threat? Usually we can't, and the brain knows it. So it cannot go back to think straight. It will be in survival mode mostly every time. So this is key because we can now know that it's very hard when we're traumatized to actually think further ahead than on our own survival. Can you pass, please? Okay. Trauma and the body. And for me, this is key because we might forget, and we do forget actually, when a traumatic uh, thing happens, we just remember just flashbacks. But the body remembers everything. And as I said, trauma lives in the body. So now I'm going to invite Anya and Joanna to go on a trip with me. So Anya, are you traveling with me? Yes. yes. Joanna, are you traveling with me? Yes. Okay, good. And I'm not just inviting Joanna and Anya, I'm just inviting everyone to take a trip. And this will show us the amazing machine we have here, here but the amazing machine we have here as well. So let's do, all do it. It's just a couple of seconds. We can do it with your eyes closed or your eyes open. And let's think, let's situate ourselves on a beach. Uh, we are standing on the sun, on the sand. We are very close to the waves. We are sitting down and we can hear the sound of the, of the waves coming and going, coming and going. We look up. And we see the stars because it's night. And then we can feel a little breeze coming to us and we feel it in the arms. Okay, Anya, no, come on, come back because I, I see that you are on the beach. So we need to come back. Joanna, come back. Well, yes, everyone come back. What did you feel? I'm curious. Anya, Joanna. Yeah, relaxed, warm when it's a cold day here. Um, 
Yeah, felt good. So you you felt it in your body, right? Were you able to hear the waves? Yes. Could you look up wind. and just actually? Yes. The wind, I felt very much. Yeah. We felt it. You felt it in your body, but you are in the UN, so <laughs> there's no <laughs> wind from the sea, right? And you, Joanna, you're in the UK, so again, it's freezing. Uh, so this is exactly what happens with the body. It remembers everything. But the question is, what happens when we are not on the beach with Anya, with Joanna? And when we are getting those thoughts of, for example, a sexual assault, we are talking about gender violence. Uh, because what happens is that the body is hyper-reactive. And this was a question made by some scientific from Harvard. And I don't want to share this because it impressed me. So they were asking themselves, why is these people overreacting? Why is these people just feeling in the body? And what they did is they asked the patients and the clients that were traumatized to get into an fMRI scan. fMRI scan is... Uh, you see the brain in real time, but it's special because you give some stimulus to the person in the scan and you can see in real time how the brain reacts, what the parts of the brain are reacting. So what they did is the, 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 the patients were laying on the scan and they were reading the story of the traumatic event. And you know what they saw? The amygdala, that was that is the one that it actually says we're in danger, was like a Christmas tree. It started to light up. So they were saying, but how is this possible? She's, I mean, this person is safe. She's in the scan, she's with me. But the brain is not thinking this. And they were also connected to some physiological measurements. So what happened? The hair, uh, heart rate over the roof. Blood, uh, blood pressure over the roof. What was happening? They were on survival mode again. So this is key also to understand treatment. Why? Because we need to know that anything that resembles the traumatic experience they lived in smells, in sounds, in stories, will, will uh, trigger the survival mode. So this is huge for understanding treatment. Can you go, can you pass it, please, Joanna? Thank you. No, the other way. Okay. So we talked that uh, uh, trauma rewires the brain, right? So it means that new connections are formed. And this means basically that we have learned something new. What do we learn after a traumatic event, after gender violence? What do we learn? Can you click, Joanna? Okay. So we just learn a new narrative about ourselves and our world. We just created a new belief system. Let me explain. Let's think that there's a girl, 10 year old girl, that has always been very safe with their parents in her house. Uh, she went to sleep every day, they tucked him in, she was safe. But all of a sudden she has, during the night, a sexual assault on behalf of his father, for example, or family member. What happens? Can you click, Shona? Okay, so this, okay. So wait, this photo, what happens is this photo, this is neuroplasticity in action, but this in a, in a negative way. These are two neurons just connecting each other and making a new system of the lip. So for this girl, my own bed, for example, is no longer safe. So if my own bed, that was the safest thing in the world, is no longer safe, nothing is. Can you click again? If my family did not take care of me, nobody will. That's the new system of the lip. Can you click again? Remaining in silence will keep me safe and love because they usually hear this. Don't say anything to your mother because she, she will be ashamed and she will not love you anymore. So remaining in silence will keep my, be you safe and loved. And this is key to understand how our brain rewires because from this new system of beliefs, we act in the world. So probably this could become into engaging in toxic relationships when you're a grown up, in not being able to speak up and to say what you believe, 
or not thinking that you're worth it. So can you just click again? Okay. And then what happens is that with this, plus flashbacks, plus memories, the reality can actually become quite unbearable. So there's here is the, the main connection with substance use disorders because these people look for numbing solutions. Nobody wants to be afraid of the dark. Nobody wants to see that they have the, the, the life they don't want to. So they can go to alcohol to get some sleep, to substances and to prescription medication. So as we do know this, uh, I think uh, it was March, Joanna, that I, I call you. I had a little conversation about this. And a baby was from was born from from this conversation, and is now I think quite a toddler now. But you want to share what happened in March? Absolutely. So thank you very much, Rocio, and um, I will just jump in to say thank you, Woodford, for organising this, and um, to the committee for inviting ISAP to be part of this today. And as Rocio said, thank you to her for having that conversation, um, which brought ISAP together with a Global Women's Network to undertake a project called The Power of Collaboration. And this was a survey that um, GWN built and then we helped really drive uh, to the people that are undertaking treatment out there. And the survey was to, uh, and responded to by 800 people from 82 countries to investigate three key areas in their treatment services. That was the availability of the um, centers and services for women, the prevalence of trauma-informed care, and digital access for women who are looking for substance use disorder treatment. So that survey was undertaken, the results were all processed, there was a lot of work that went into that. And then the key findings were put together into three infographics. And um, again, you know, so much work and we really uh, appreciate all of the work that Rocio and GWN put into this. But three key infographics, which are hopefully going to make this information and then actions that people can take very accessible so that they are there as tools for people to use, um, not sort of tied up in too much elaborate uh, research and language. These are really action orientated pieces that we hope will, everybody will be able to use. They have just been published in the Addictology Journal, which um, is a journal which comes from Charles University in Prague and we collaborate with them. And so they are there, they're going to be all over ISAP's communications, all over Global Women Network communications, and they're in the journal um, just, I think, last week, the week before they were published, Rocio. So it's, we're really excited that this um, survey has turned into something so useful and so widely accessible for people. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about what we found and what you'll see what um, is in those infographics. And first of all, looking at the treatment programs for women. So as you can see, 83% of um, respondents said that they have mixed prog programs. 8.2% are only, do women only treatment services and 8.9 men only. So most people are undertaking mixed programs. And this is where we want to get you all involved and anyone on the panel can jump in as well um, to give their response. But the next question that we asked was, you know, how many treatment centers offer gender specific treatment programs? So what do you think in, in terms of numbers out of 10? We'd love to see your response in the chat. How many? Come on. What percentage? Go on, Rocio. What do you think? I mean, out of the 10 treatment centers, how many of them have a gender programs? I don't see any. any. Yeah? Two. Two. Celine. Mm. Okay. What else? Two. 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 Five. Okay. Three. Okay, 
Don't cheat. The one who knows, don't cheat. Five, three, six, eight. Eight percent. Okay. Three percent. I don't know. What do you think, Joanna? What was the yeah, information we had? From... Twelve. Sorry, Andrea, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Four percent. Yes. People is engaging. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and someone even said zero in their country. So, um, you know, interesting to see the range. So from the respondents, we had three out of 10. So, you know, when we know the numbers of women that need these services, it's so incredibly disappointing that, you know, people are not able to provide that, that three out of 10 is there. So then before the next... we, sorry, but before we move on, Joanna, because yeah. you are the chief of ASAP and you have a lot of uh, members and providers all around the world. And we just talk about the importance of trauma and the importance of, you know, gender violence. What do you think this number means for the workforce and how can we help? Because three out of 10 is very low, right? Yeah, I think it means that people don't fully understand in some you know, situations people don't fully understand what the needs are and that they are different and then how to access those needs. I think we all know the workforce is overwhelmed and everyone would do more if they could, you know, that uh, everybody is, is really working incredibly hard and it's not an easy area to work in. There's not enough funding. There's not enough support in, I would say, almost all places. So I think that that is, you know, common that people are not necessarily doing what they know that they could if they had the full um, support and capacity. But I think for those that do see it as a need, having these clear guidelines on how to do it is really important. Um, and I think that's what we continually hear. Training, information, clear clear knowledge is, is what they want to see. Yeah, okay, so we have one infographic that is specifically for this. So you can find it in the, in the QR that, uh, you shared go ahead I'm sorry no no it's good thanks for jumping in so then as we said that um the uh, one of the topics that was covered in the survey was trauma and the first sort of question in this section just asked people whether they thought that experiences of trauma contribute to the development of substance use disorders and you can see here as we said, people know that this is a need. 95.1% either answered um, that, you know, four or five, no, five, so extreme. And then, um, you know, we see that there's so many people saw, four, yeah, four or five, that this was really important and that it does contribute to that development. Oops, sorry. And then of those um, respondents, 90.8% also agreed that traumatic experiences affect the outcomes of the treatment. So, you know, it again comes back, people see that this is a need, they just don't perhaps know how exactly to use, implement that trauma-informed care. So this is back to the audience and to my fa fellow panelists. What percentage of the, the people that were in services that responded to this survey use a standardized tool for screening and or assessing trauma and PTSD? Come on, so, I want to see these numbers. Yeah. One. <laughs> One. <laughs> Come on, I want to see more numbers. Zero. Okay, they are not, yes, two. No, okay, not very pessimistic. This time. One, okay. Yes, four, yeah. less than one. Remembering 15. how many people answered that they thought it did impact substance use disorders. So, you know, no, over 90% said that they thought it would affect it. And yet we're seeing the, the low, people have low expectations here. I will put you all out of your misery. Almost 70% of providers do not use a standardized tool. Um, and of the 30.1% who said that they did, 
Um, 32% of them did not specify the tools they employed. So we were really trying to find out what people are doing and if they are doing it, how they are doing it. Um, yeah. So you can see everyone recognized how important it was, but people didn't have the tools or the ability to actually implement it. And Joanna, just to jump in here, uh, we saw this particular data very important because we know that if 70% are not uh, screened or assessing for trauma, it means they are not treating for trauma. We cannot yeah. treat what we don't know yeah. that we are treating. So that's the yeah. first problem. So we can we can think that 70% are not treating trauma. And the other part is we can think that, as you said, maybe they don't have the tools and the resources to do so. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have the tools and the resources to treat trauma or PTSD, which is true that we shouldn't screen it because we cannot make a promise that we will do something and then don't. But I, as, we, as, we, as we said, it's a call to action for every treatment in the world to actually screen, assess, and treat substance use disorders. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, it's good. But whilst I have you and we're sort of looking at this in terms of an answer that people talked about trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, could you just talk a little bit about the difference between those two? About trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder? Yes, please. So uh, trauma is like an emotional response, and it's exactly what we said, but what we talked about. But in a practical way, I would say it this way. Trauma is like a ghost. When you're traumatized, it's like a ghost because... All of the symptoms you had, we just talked about, all these new narratives, all these new beliefs, nobody sees them, right? You really don't act out. But when PTSD, that is actually a, a huge disorder and a very severe one, has very like colorful symptoms, like very hard flashbacks. Uh, it's it's horrible, really. The person even can't. I mean, I had. I remember my first PTSD diagnosed case she was a professor on the university she was huge in what she was doing and she had a ptsd and every day she went to the corner to buy some bread and she couldn't do it she couldn't go to buy bread okay so that is ptsd so trauma is a ghost that changes your lives and nobody knows that is why we need to know the symptoms right and ptsd if you see it you probably know. However, thank you for asking this, Joanna, because here, for example, in Argentina, in many places, we don't know how to screen or even assess for PTSD. It's not the same. And they are get very confused with anxiety disorders. And if we actually do not treat PTSD, it could get very, very bad. Thank you. That's a really sure. useful illustration. Thank you. Um, and then one last response that I don't think anyone would be surprised about. 98% said that they would like training in how to do this. So, you know, we saw the information and then we saw that resounding call for, you know, we see it as a need. Now, please help us um, respond to that need amongst our clients. So I think then it's now back to you, Rocio, in terms of, what are the tools and the implementation strategies that people on the ground can actually use? Okay. One more. Okay, so this is the last you're going to hear from me. But um, I, I know Anya is going to talk about this as well. So I'm just going to talk about neuroplasticity. As the same way we saw that it, the trauma changes the brain because of neuroplasticity, it means the ability to rewire itself. We could rewire it for trauma, but then we can rewire it for healing and recovery. So when we think about how to recover, there are two goals. One, we need to teach ourselves because this is something I also want to address. Um, if one out of three women suffer gender violence, Many of uh, uh, providers have suffered gender violence and are probably traumatized or have PTSD. So we need to know how to deal with ourselves. So the first is how to cope with these feelings of being overwhelmed by the emotions that we talked about. And then how to regain control of our lives so that the new narrative that the trauma actually wrote on us 
does not control us. And the first one is safe treatment environment. And I know every one of you know about this, but I really hope that after this conversation we had, it changes how and why we need safe environments. Because we know that if a woman is not, that is traumatized and is not in a safe environment, what will happen? She will have so many triggers that she will be on survival mode all of the time. And she won't be able to concentrate and focus on her healing and recovery. The second thing is trust. We need to be very reliable. We need to uh, be consistent. And please, let's do not walk away. When we know someone is traumatized, we need to stick to what we say because they need trust. Relationships when you are healing from trauma are key. Then some interoception practices are good for um, neuroplasticity because they are the ones that help you go inside you and see, okay, so what are the patterns? So that is why, for example, journaling exists because you can write what is happening to me, what I'm feeling, where I feel stuck, and what are my core beliefs on that. So there I can see all my patterns that are not mine, are from the trauma, and I can start changing them. Then emotion regulation techniques. We have this conversation with Joanna one time, and I'm going to share something that is mine. So I discovered after working on my self-awareness that when I'm humming, I have an intrusive thought that is not nice, me, myself. So I, re I realized that if I find myself like... <laughs> I realize now that why am I humming? And it's like an effect of my body to try to cope with the thing I'm thinking that is not nice. So humming works very, very well. And the last one I'm gonna say is exposure because it's, it's gradual, of course, but the body needs to learn that, for example, sleeping alone in the dark is, is not dangerous anymore. It was, but it's not dangerous anymore. That going to buy bread, it's not dangerous anymore. That the danger has passed, and now we can be not in survival mode all the time, but we can actually start living in the present and actually thinking of a better future to ourselves. That's what I'm, what I'm gonna say about this. And Anya, we cannot wait to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you so much, um, Rocio, and thanks everybody for the invitation to the webinar today, which is obviously a special day. And uh, just to come on, commemorate that um, all together. And let me just also share you a few slides that I have brought along um, for today. Let me see if I have more luck kind of with showing you this. Let's see, can you also give me a heads up if you can see slides? Yes, you can. Okay, so that's moving well. So um, I honestly thought um, instead of what we are usually often doing also as UN in our presentations, I will highlight a special presentation, which is really um, women using drugs and with drug use disorders in their own words throughout this um, presentation and their traumatic experiences surely will come out um, of that. So maybe also a tiny little bit of trigger warning because there's quite um, drastic language in this um, own words, no pictures, but um, the language is sometimes drastic. And as said, so today is a special day because we're all commemorating together the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. That's every year on 25th of November and um, so, and violence against women has been defined as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, psychological harm or suffering to women. And this further specified, but it also has been recognized that there are some groups of women and girls um, that are more vulnerable and face greater risks. And I think here kind of the topic of women using drugs and with drug use disorders um, surely comes in. So this is more kind of from the World Drug Report, same as Joanna had showed a survey with treatment centers. We at UNODC, we get our data from the UN member states. And I mean, and um, what we know is that men are more likely to use drugs than women in general, right? 
And overall, women account for one in four people who has used the drug in the past year, in this case, 2022. But we can see that by region, but also by substance, there is variation. And for especially the non-medical use of pharmaceutical opioids and other prescription medications, women account for nearly half of all the people um, that are using drugs or internationally controlled substances in this sense. And what worries us, and I think that's also what just has been reflected when you made your own assessments, right, of how many services specifically for women or for women in general are available, that also at global level we can see, which is already a scandal, that only one in 11 people who would need drug treatment has access to it, but there is a huge gender gap because for women, it's only one in 18 that have access to treatment, right? Whereas for men on global average, it's one in seven. And then in addition, you know, you see here in green, there are vast differences um, between certain regions and some regions access for women is a bit easier um, than in other regions. So, and also when it comes to injecting drug use, Again, it's one in five people who inject drugs as a woman, so less women inject drugs than men, but um, there is kind of, they carry a higher burden of health and social consequences. For example, a 1.2 times more likely um, to be living with HIV than their male um, peers. So in that sense, kind of World Drug Report and all our UNODC publications acknowledge very much that um, women who use drugs are very vulnerable also to gender-based violence, sexual abuse, and that can be perpetrated. And I think that's something um, also of importance on this day that we are commemorating, both by their intimate partners or by other people who use drugs around them, but also by law enforcement, by drug service providers and others that are in reality there um, to help them, which of course gives a huge feeling of um, insecurity and unsafety. So and what I wanted to show you today is kind of this needs assessment on women who use drugs that our office in South Africa did already a few years ago in 2019. But I think kind of the experience of these women is pretty universal and could be in any other place. And um, therefore just um, to listen to them maybe on this day today and even a few years later, um, I thought is um, something we could do together today. So this report was done really to gain a better understanding of the experiences and needs of women who use drugs by listening to them, engaging directly with their communities to also identify then of course ways um, to provide support and have a better understanding. So among the challenges identified was very, very much violent violence in different ways, right? So that could be like you see here from the quote in the middle, um, something where the intimate partner, the husband, so to say, was a perpetrator, but also women spoke about violence beyond physical violence and having to do with um, discrimination, um, with not having access to safety so that they maybe could not trust uh, public um, authorities and that they did not have control about their own finances. So also could not, um, let's say, secure safety for themselves as they didn't have access to any resources or means. But violence was very much a common experience or theme that emerged. And it was linked kind of with this feeling of discrimination and no support, even when you report an act of violence or um, an act of um, uh, a traumatic experience, right? So, and we they very much would need this support when they already take the courage to say, for example, like you saw the title of the publication was, were you really raped or just not paid, right? So when they actually take the courage to report a rape, often then in their experience, instead of being supported, right, they have this experience of being further discriminated against and not taken serious and not supported. Um, I know it then, um, continuing challenges kind of went in this direction that even when they went kind of seeking um, services and be in contact with services, um, often they had the feeling that the services could not meet 
and meet their needs, maybe, you know, because there were long waiting times and given their um, situation, they couldn't, or really this feeling of being dehumanized and uh, very much, very much so, as you can see in the quotes here, being stigmatized um, against. Services, um, again, for various reasons were perceived as being highly um, inaccessible and that then in a way, right, is what here um, on a personal level on the other side was what's reflected in the high level statistics in World Drug Report, right, so there was a perceived at least lack of healthcare services. Um, and no kind of shelter and safe spaces available for um, women as they felt. I mean, most of the treatment services, as you have been discussed, and in general worldwide, are mainly um, designed for men. And um, they did not know very much about the existence of psychosocial services close to them, even though those did exist, right? So, and because of the fear of being stigmatized against, there was in a way like a self-exclusion from approaching services, which goes back kind of to this um, entire um, history as described and uh, feeling, you know, not being in a safe place when trying to get services as they were designed for others or service providers or other kind of local authorities. So to say they did not have the feeling uh, they could trust. So, but with all these challenges also from the community and as this was a needs assessment report, there were also a numerous uh, recommendations coming up, right? So um, uh, urgent need to address various very basic physical needs. Um, that the women had in terms of health, but also hygiene, shower, and so on. Um, obviously, that something needs to be done to healthcare services on a continuum of care, really, from harm reduction, low threshold services, all the way through medication assisted treatment or residential rehabilitation services that would cater much better for their needs and very much address kind of this, um, not only the perception, but actually provide um, safety, right? And provide safety on a continued basis and support. And one of the things the women felt is important for that, I'm sorry, now uh, we jump somewhere. One of the women felt is to have a peer network, right? So to listen and support each other and be empowered to be able to support each other then in maybe safe spaces and shelters um, where they can learn and um, support each other. So the report really ends kind of with a call or as so this is a call for action maybe also today, but the call kind of to maybe listen more and listen to the experiences and listen also to the solutions that are provided by people using services, people using drugs, people not in contact with services yet. And in this sense, um, especially women. And on this slide, I've just very briefly put kind of the principles for trauma-informed care, in this case from SAMHSA in the US, but I think they have been very universally um, adapted around safety, trustworthiness, peer support, as said also came out in the report, collaboration, empowerment, have a voice, have a choice, and a, um, a recognition of cultural and historical issues in different contexts. So with that, just to point you very quickly to a number of resources available, and many of you maybe have also contributed to the development of those for um, improving services um, for women and girls who use drugs and with drug use disorders, mainstreaming trauma-informed, gender-sensitive and person-centered care that has an evidence base, obviously, into health and social services um, overall. And also just to say, I did not put this on the slide, but maybe here you can see also from our justice section at UNODC, there are numerous tools available also how um, on a, in a legal perspective, we can support women and girls that have been victims of violence. So and this is kind of more from the international standards for treatment of drug use disorders, numerous recommendations 
what we need to be in place. I've just highlighted here again a bit in the line with the topic of um, our, our seminar today, trauma-informed practices and safety considerations, but also you know, numerous other services starting early, social support, vocational support, addressing stigma, access to general healthcare beyond drug treatment, all of this kind of that needs to be there and service providers and community to be sensitized in the role that they can play. This I'm just leaving you kind of as reference to say that this has left the cycles of practitioners and uh, technical documents that also international policy making bodies like the Commission on Narcotic Drugs or the General Assembly of the UN have passed numerous resolutions and statements in support of um, the, the addressing the specific needs um, of women with drug use disorders. And um, I think that at international level is also something you all can refer to. And coming to a closing, I just want to say or invite you all that on the 2nd of December, there will be um, an additional event kind of by hosted by the UN kind of on uh, in the framework of the 16 days of activism against gender based violence. And um, this is especially a collaboration, I think, between UN Women and UNODC around the prevention of um, femicide. And with that, um, I thank you very much. And I want to leave you here this little poem that uh, Catherine Bota, who was one of the participants in the report that I showed you before, has written. And she was very happy to have her name associated with it and, sh and shared with everybody. So she says, the time to do it is always now. You can't have a doubting heart. So once the first has begun, the things you thought you couldn't do have already been halfway um, done. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention, for putting this webinar together. And maybe just to say also very quickly that I'd like to thank my colleague Daria for putting the slides together with us. Thank you so much. Over to you, Rosil. Wow, that was very emotional. Uh, Anya, it was incredible how it, you, could, you could just display how people that go through gender violence, around the world is like, there's a disbelief, a chronic disbelief. Are you sure that happened to you? Are you sure? And yes, we are sure. Yes, we are sure, right? And it actually, and it impacts in every part of us and has huge consequences. And it made me think that it not, it, it not only has consequences for women and their families, but actually impacts in the health of governments and and countries and the world, because if women are impaired to think, to go through, to be, to recover, they cannot work, they cannot raise their children as they want to. So it is a huge problem that goes beyond a traumatic experience. What do you think, Jonna? Yeah, I totally agree. The impact upon society and community is um, significant and hard to quantify. So we don't have the data that's you know easy to give evidence for that, but it's very simple to see how beneficial it is to put these tools in place, make the access, put the access there. Yeah. Well, Chantal, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I was just thinking, I think it was Henry Jones who kind of shared with us that if and when any woman kind of comes close to a treatment service, right? So that we have to roll a red carpet, right, to really then make the access as easy and safe and supportive as we can, right? Because, I mean, just getting anywhere close to has already been um, a huge effort, given, so to say, the experience that I outlined, like in this report. So I, for me, it's a very um, helpful picture to think of the red carpet, right? So. Yeah, I'm going to acknowledge because Henry Jones is here. So, Henry, thank you for being here and supporting us. Thank you very much. Chantal, back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rocio, Joanna, and Anya. Wow. And I encourage all attendees to join in that conversation because this is a call to action. Use that hashtag, no excuse. Take screenshots, write down information from this webinar, share on social media, because it is the importance learning about trauma, importance of the tools, resources to address, screening, assessing. There's so much. So please, um, this is a call to action. So be collaborative. 
share on social media, hashtag no excuse. There are a couple questions. So there was a question placed in the chat. So we'll address that one first and I'll go into the Q&A box. The first question states, how effective are these standardized tools to diagnose PTSD since the DSM-5 keeps updating the diagnostic criteria? Uh, do you wanna take this? Should I take this? Okay, so um, for me, they are, very precise and especially in PTSD. So there are two things. One of the one I use a lot for PTSD is the one that was made by Edna Foa because she was the creator of the exposure therapy, prolonged exposure therapy. And I, I, I was grateful enough to train with her. So I think it's very accurate and it actually gives you a step-by-step -step on the screening, the assessment, and then how to treat it. So I found that this or oh, that is the most uh, precise screening tool for PTSD. I don't know if we have it already in the GWN website, but if we don't, we're gonna put it there and you will find it, um, um, that resource like in a few days. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to go on because there are a couple other questions and it's a little bit after nine. Okay. There's another, the first question in the Q and A box. Uh, we're not providing any funding. I think this question is referring to, but maybe if somebody has a recommendation, how to establish an entity to assist women who are victims of substance use disorder with trauma. Does anyone have a recommendation? It's somebody looking for funding. So and it says, how can fund an NGO or nonprofit organization to establish an entity to assess women who are victims of substance use disorder with trauma? Well, I can, what I can say about this is that from GWN, we do have a program. It's a technical assistance program that you can apply if you're treating women. And there's a part that you need uh, help or assistance with in your program. In this case, it could be trauma. You can apply to be very meticulous of what you need and we will give you an answer about it because we pro we provide technical assistance on site and virtually not, not everyone gets it but if you apply it's a possibility it would be uh, a global global network in the website i'm going to type it on the chat thank you Rocio. and maybe just to say that you know, um, I always first and foremost hold states accountable, right? So, I mean, there are inter agreements that um, UN member states have taken and responsibilities they have taken. So in that sense, you know, to also hold them accountable for the commitments they have taken to prevent violence against women or provide gender-based um, drug treatment services. I think that's, uh, you know, in a way the first addressee and then working together, you know, between states, civil society and all the actors that come on board. And, you know, I said very much or very important, so to say, to then have the experience of women with lived or living um, experience in the design um, of such um, programs. So, and, you know, I'm happy also to share afterwards around where from our side, both on the justice and on the health side, some of the resources are that uh, were mentioned. Thank you. And I see what you're calling. Daria just sent everyone, every, every resource <laughs> on the chat. So thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the other question is, what are some of the standardized screening tools for trauma? Again, we will go back to, to that. I don't know, Anya or Joanna, do you want to say something about it? Um, so the one I like a lot is the ACE. The, uh, this, is a, this is a questionnaire that actually goes back. It's used by millions and millions of people around the world. It has a lot of research. So I think there are about between 15 and 18 questions that you can really see uh, what that person went through as a child and you can get a pretty much good idea on the traumatized actually has a scale. So that's a great one to use and it's not too invasive. So that's, that's, that's good. Perfect. And then there's just a couple of questions about the presentation slides and recording. We will send out a link to the recording. And then as long as each presenter, are we able to share your presentation? Yes. Okay. So we will send that out after, after the present, after the webinar, we will send that out, um, the recording along with the presentation. 
And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go on with our next two presentations and then any unaddressed questions, we will do that at the end. If you do have any questions, because the chat box is pretty big, can you move them over to the Q&A box? That way it'll be easier to address at the end. Okay, thank you again, Rocio, Anya, Joanna. Let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, now we will hear from Namboga, Daisy, and Farhad Hossein. Daisy is a dedicated social worker with extensive experience in youth empowerment and community development. Currently serving as a monitoring and evaluation officer at Uganda Youth Developmental Link, she has successfully contributed to impactful projects such as DREAMS HIV Prevention Initiative and the Urban Youth Empowerment Project. So welcome, Daisy. Thank you. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm happy to be here and to be part of this team. Uh, special thanks to World Federation Against Drugs and uh, all the organizers of this webinar. We are very happy and pleased to be part of the team. So Maja, could you please share my presentation? Chantel, do you have them at hand right now? I can't get it though. I don't, but I will. That would be crazy. Super. Something is happening with communications today, right? My presentation, now this one, right? Something is happening in the sky. Just saying. Also, Chantal, just to say that if they have any more questions, they can send it back to WFAD, of course, or Free America, and then we can answer them. If they, we have no more time, that would be great as well. We can do that. Absolutely. Okay. It. I'm trying to get on the clouds and get it. It's just frozen. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no worries. No worries. You maybe we uh, go for Farhat first if you don't find the Daisy presentation. If you have it. Yeah. But... We are ready to do, if you allow. Okay, perfect. Let's go ahead and start with you. And that way, hopefully, it'll unfreeze. <laughs> okay, right. let's welcome Farheed Hussein. He's a human rights activist in Bangladesh. So go ahead and take it over. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Rahman. On behalf of LEAD, I'd like to present our presentations. So basically, we are Lido and we are working for the street children in Bangladesh since 2000. Uh, this type of street children are mostly affected by substance use disorder and other mental disorder, which directly or somehow related to the other elements like gender-based violence, drug addiction, trauma, street-based violence, child sex trafficking, etc. So we are going to introduce ourselves and to tell how we deal against these social problems through our various activities. Okay, I like to share uh, the presentation just to give me time. We can see it. It's perfect. 
everyone can see okay okay thank you so we are local education and economic development organization uh, short form of lido Uh, basically, Lido is a non-profit organization and voluntary-based development organization founded in 2000 and fully functioned in 2010. So here is our uh, registration number and other uh, legal uh, information. So where is our vision? Uh, through raising awareness, of the pilot uh, plight of highly vulnerable street children, all members of society will take responsibility for ensuring the protection of street children and thereby allow them to have a bright future. Uh, here is our missions. Uh, I just go through. So here is our four method of work. Uh, first one is rescue, refer, reintegration, and rebuild the lives. Lido focused on its direct support, awareness, and advocacy for ensuring the rights and protection of street-connected children. Uh, operate three transitional shelter, five school under the sky, one peace home, uh, four shopner patshala, one exclusive school for specially able children, and one mobile school. So these are our approach of work. Uh, first one, uh, first one is seat link, then school under the sky, uh, then mobile toilet, trust building, listening the kids' story. Uh, after that, rescue, uh, general diary, uh, then uh, refer them, then transitional shelter, then re reintegration to families, refer for rehabilitation, and after that, peace home. Rescue children. After rescuing the children from vulnerable situations, social mobilizers meet with the police or the uh, legal authority in our country filing up the GD or general diary. Refer to shelter. Social mobilizers are referring children to other organizations for long-term revelation. Family reintegration. Social mobilizers are reuniting the children into their families. Here you can see all those pictures as well. Here's the mobile school, uh, and we operate uh, the mobile school in a five field. Transitional shelter. The children are enjoying a transitional shelter, Shetu Bandhan. KFC Shopner Patshala. Lido has been implementing the school Shopner Patshala with the support of Transcom Food Limited, KFC Bangladesh, four stores from the month of December 2022. Lido intends to support many homeless assist connected children to give them opportunity to study non-formal education at KFC four stores at KFC Dhanmondi, Polton, Adabor, Elephant Road. Every store has 25 children. Transcom Food Limited and Lido partner will work, collaborate in the Betterment of street connected children. So, Dhaka Pictures, here is the Dhaka Pictures. Mr. Farhad Hussain, our ex founder and executive director of Lido, proposed the concept of Dhaka Pictures to be developed by six months, uh, six youths from, sorry, six youths from the Lido Peace Home in collaboration with Conrad Alabas and Jamila van der Hals. This exhibition marks the culmination of the three photo workshop which engaged young participants from Lido Pisum. The workshop was skillfully uh, crafted and led by acclaimed filmmakers Conrad Alabas and Jamila van der Hals of Dutch based Jaja Films Productions. Under the Dhaka pictures, these building photographers embarked on a journey to capture the essence of Dhaka, focusing on its people and streets. Conrad Alavas, in particular, played a pivotal role in mentoring our young photographers, encouraging them to explore the vibrant streets and immortalize their perspective through the lens. Their collective efforts have resulted in a captive exhibition offering glimpses into the soul of Dhaka. 
preserved and presented through a Google Drive link from the wider appreciation. Dhaka Pictures own an award at the Los Angeles Photography, also own the Best Photojournalism Award, the Luminous Frames Festival in Denmark. Dhaka Pictures photographers always capture photos to stop street-based violence against the children, girls, and women. Okay, here is our another uh, initiative, Sanitary Pad Machine. Uh, Lido has been supporting vulnerable steel connected children since 2010, running five schools under the sky, one mobile school, two transitional shelter, and the Lido Peace Home, which care for 52 children, 40% whom are girls. Street Child United donated a sanitary pad machine enabling Lido to provide clean and safe menstrual products to girls, reducing health risks. This initiative ensures girls can attend school regularly, promoting their education and well-being. By managing uh, menstruating with dignity, the girl experiences less stigma and better mental health. Lilona produces sanitary pads monthly for all projects. Girls. From June 2022 to October, we rescued children about 1,792 were referred to the shelter. Number is 525. Uh, reintegration in families, 1,106. Uh, emergency, we gave emergency food support to 1,21,521. And our child sponsorship program covered 250 children. And we support state family rehabilitation, 25. From 221 to 24, uh, there are training and work, 18 training and workshops we provided, awareness and advocacy, 60 uh, events we provided for awareness and advocacy. And we have 114 mobile skills. And uh, also our Kids participate uh, three child walker. Drug engaged along with abuse by the fourth sex. Lido's youth activities prudently have been implemented by its commitment and development associated youths from long time. One of the vibrant work is preventing drug addiction among the street bound children and girls who are drug engaged along with the abuse by the fourth sex. Preventing street children from falling into drug addiction requires innovative and comprehensive approaches. Some ideas to prevent street children from engaging drug and drug addictions, early intervention programs, education and skills training, mentorship and role models, art and recreation therapy, peer support groups, sustainable livelihood projects, collaboration with local business, advocacy and policy change, family strengthening initiatives, and mass awareness campaign. So here are uh, our uh, defined kind of advocacy and public awareness activities. Uh, recently, you all know that in our country, we have a, a political unrest. So this is the recent uh, issue of our country. So uh, we uh, recently we surveyed on the sufferings of street children during July August political unrest and curfew and wanted to know their uh, mental and physical health. Also, we did a human chain to demand to announce specific roadmap to bring back democracy. Her, uh, there are also some public. If you, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. If you could wrap up in about one minute. Yeah, sure, sure. Please. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, I'll be a little first then. Then I'd like to uh, pass these slides and go to the SUD, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, no these are the all activities we provide to our street children to prevent the uh, violations, street based violations, and gender based violations. You can see all the advocacy and uh, public awareness campaigns. Due to the time short, I just passed those slides. Uh, we're doing a human chain, cycle rally. Okay. Uh, this is the main topic, uh, advancing trauma-informed substance uh, use disorder services. Okay. 
Substance use disorder is treatable mental disorder affective brain function and behavior often uh, co-occurs with mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, ADHD, and sinophenia. The relation between uh, ACUD and mental health is multifaceted, involving shared risk factors, uh, mutual influence, or one condition contributing to the other. Addressing uh, ACUD, especially among street-connected children, is critical as the face compounded vulnerabilities, including physical and mental trauma. We focuses on saving street dwellers from the harsh realities of homeless and SUD. Through outreach programs at high-risk locations, Lilo provides information, resources, and referrals for uh, addiction treatment. Crisis shelters serve as safe spaces offering medical care, uh, psychological support, education, and vocational training to help children reintegrate into society. Through our volunteer work, they can learn to take responsibilities for their own communities and society. To remove their stigma, we invited community leaders to recognize our children. We visit religious and historic places to build morality to our children. Also, in our young journalism program, vulnerable youths are grooming for being professional to talk about their rights and duty to civil society. A core aspect of leaders' work is addressing trauma among child survivors of ACUD and gender-based violence. Activities include motivation and physical engagement such as sports, art, gardening, puppet shows, cultural sessions, and music therapy, which helps children rebuild confidence and trauma reduce trauma. Leader also connects children to global personal like the street, child cricket, and football World Cup to foster positive engagement and amplify their voices. Lido's Peace Home provides a safe, inclusive environment where children receive comprehensive trauma recovery education and mental health resources. Collaboration with law enforcement uh, and social workers enhance the referral system to ensure ongoing support for SUD affected and gender-based violence survivors' children. Preliminary findings highlighted improved resilience, reduced re relapse rates, and strengthened trust in Lido's participants. Every year, we are risking 400 to 500 child who are directly or indirectly child sex survivors affected by street-based violence and gender-based violence. Every day, the number is increasing, so we need to expand our collaboration to rescue them from more vulnerable situations. So uh, these are some of our photos of children activities, uh, Child World Cup. So uh, due to the short of time, I just pass those. Okay, this is our schools, school under the sky, where we are building trust building to our street people who are traumatized uh, for many reasons and try to uh, bring them to our shelter and giving their better education, psychological and mental support uh, so that they can uh, change their life. So maybe my time is running out, so uh, I will pass the slides. So here are the media coverage of our organizations, as you can see. <clears throat> Yes, thank you so much for sharing all the incredible work you're doing. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. That's for all. And sorry for the timing. A little bit big, uh, our presentation it was a little bit big. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Oh, thank you very much. And then uh, can we share that with the attendees, your presentation, so they can view the entire presentation? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. You can show them. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. After. Thank you so much. And for those in the chat asking about certain questions, I'll save the chat and we will send that in the follow-up email to everyone. And then Daisy, you are good to go. Um, okay, thank you. Let me share my screen shortly. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, um, um, I'm Lambo Daisy. 
based in Uganda. I'm a social worker working with Uganda Youth Development League. So, um, in UDEM, its vision is to see young people live a good quality life free from exploitation. As you see my cover page, it portrays uh, one of the slums in Kampala district and why slums? Because we work with vulnerable young people and these are our hotspots. This is where we find our beneficiaries that we work with. Uh, my title is Advancing Trauma-Informed Subsistence Use Disorder Services for Marginalized Youth in Slums of Kampala and Addressing Gender-Based Violence. So let us drive into the introduction. So you will see most of the young people we are working, we, we are supporting, they face multiple challenges, including poverty, including poverty, unemployment, including poverty, unemployment, history of crime, um, survival sex, uh, limited education. Of course, some don't even go to school. So um, they're exposed to substance use. So it is uh, used as a coping mechanism for trauma but also it wasn't their mental health and social outcomes. So we are going to explore the links or the cycle between trauma, subsistence use, and GBV. Also share and propose UDEL integrated trauma-informed interventions. Uh, UDEL was founded in 1993. We work with young people aged 13 to 24 years. Why that age bracket? Because we have that expertise in that area, in, in that age group in Kampala and Wakiso district. Some of the services we offer is psycho social support, because most of us, we are social workers, uh, reproductive health education, HIV, AIDS prevention, drug use prevention. Why prevention? Prevention is less costly, and uh, we, we, we get more quick wins than the treatment bit. Um, we also have vocational skills training. We train young people to, to equip them with skills and access to job markets, uh, linkages, and referral systems. Um, slide three, we have a line graph. It shows young people that we enroll under different vulnerability categories. And as you see, the first one is um, GBV survivors. GBV is gender-based violence survivors out of school. We also have refugees, teenage mothers, those who are trafficked, those who use drugs, uh, barmaids, um, CSW is commercial sex work, those who are homeless and housemates. So um, I, I want to draw your attention to this line graph why? because you would find one young person has all the, is, falls under the various vulnerability categories. For example, one young person can be a school dropout, can still be a teenage mother, can still be trafficked, can still be homeless, but at the same time using drugs. So if you see our curve, um, we have many school dropouts, but we also have many young people that are used, that are engaging in sex work. However, you will see that subsistence use, sorry, substance use is cross-cutting. So you will see these young people use the drugs as a coping mechanism, like to overcome their life stressors. Um, in our registers, uh, we have uh, data that shows that young people um, have a history of early child separation from parents, child abuse and environment, first violence at a very early age, experience suicide ideation, and it is at 30%. We have teenage mothers, percentage of 35% trafficked and uh, who are sexually exploited. So my motivation uh, comes from my personal background. I also grew up in the slums. I schooled in the slums. I had friends that, that were experiencing the similar problems. So 
I'm empathetic to these young people because you'll find they have a combination of life stressors. They are facing multiple challenges at the same time concurrently. So I'm empathetic to them. And my desire is to make a positive change in their lives. Um, my test one in Nanclavia. So Nanclavia is a parish in Uganda. So this is one of the drop-in centers, one of the drop-in centers of UDEL. And um, I happened to enroll a young, a young man in 2017, and he preferred tailoring skill. So after the one year, because we scale them six to six months to one year. So after scaling them, we graduated him. So I received a certain call from the parent that he 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 wants to beat to beat up his dad because of not going not reporting at work. So I rushed to his home. And the mother narrated to me that the young man is using drugs. So I questioned the mother that when did he start to use drugs? The mother told me even before she, before the young person joined UDEL, he was using the drugs. But when for me, I enrolled this young man, for me, I thought he's only a school dropout. So I didn't even realize that he was using the drugs. So maybe when we are doing the interventions, because the mother said, when he joined UDEL, he stopped using the drugs. So after graduating him off, I think he relapsed and he used, he, he resorted to use of the drugs. And uh, what we did, I managed to work with the, with the mother and we referred him to Utabika Mental Hospital. It is our national referral hospital in Uganda. And um, after one month, he was discharged. Unfortunately, two to three months, I, I was informed that he, he, he has died. So my key point is, this man was using cut and marijuana, but I couldn't notice, I, I couldn't even tell that he was using the drugs. For me, I thought, the young man was only a school dropout. So, and he he passed on because of substance-related health issues, because the kidney and the liver were destroyed. So what do we learn from it? Uh, we need there is we, we need to do thorough case management as as practitioners. We also there is need for capacity building for us because not every social worker is trauma informed. We also need better resettlement plans for for the young people. Then case two, um, I received- I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Can you potentially end in, a, in about a minute because we're past the time? Okay, then I'll proceed to another slide. So, so we are going to see a connection between subsistence use and DBV connection. So you will see uh, subsistence use Intoxication impairs judgment and escalates aggression. So the young people are always aggressive and they are taken as violent people. And subsistence use in domestic settings increases instability and virus risk. So whenever these young people use a drugs, they are at a risk of being violated, but also to violate other people. So GBV in ma in sorry. GBV in marginalized communities, we see that there is economic dependency and society norms. For example, a man should, should, shouldn't should uh, speak out when maybe a, a woman has beaten him. He's supposed to, he's not supposed to cry, but he's supposed to, to keep quiet. So the broader implication is uh, lack of trauma-informed approaches perpetuates cycles of abuse and addiction. So these are our young people doing um, doing sports and aerobics. It is one of the strategy or, or, or approach that we use to make sure that young people are drug free. We also give out resettlement kits to young people before we integrate them because you cannot talk about drug 
that the drug button when you're not economically empowering the young people you need to economically empower them because the reasons as to why they're using the drugs it is because they are idle they don't have what to do and they 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 are economically disempowered so some of the challenges that we face, uh, we have um, understaffing, mean, um, limited social workers, many beneficiaries, the language. For example, for some locations, they speak actually and some social workers don't know actually. The big numbers compared to the resources, the long distances uh, to, to, of course, our drop-in center are in the slums near, near the young people, but there are not many we uh, compared to the numbers we receive to be supported. The inactive policy, for example, the ideal gender policy in 2005, it was initiated in 2005, so we need to, to revise it. Um, inadequate funding for referrals, of course, transportation, medical needs, and legal processes. Then the structural gaps, we have um, lack of digital equipment to use for capacity building and networking. We have limited trauma-informed care for social workers, is, uh, efficient referral systems and follow-ups mechanisms. So proposed solutions, uh, we looked at integrated community and capacity build, building. One, uh, for integrated, we have trauma-informed education. We need to train the young people, that we need to train the practitioners or social workers to be trauma-informed so that they can deliver well. Then rehabilitation programs of addressing both, not only one aspect, but both uh, substance use disorder and GBV. We also need to do community engagement. We need safer spaces for survivors to share their experiences. And also awareness campaigns targeting societal norms and risks. Then capacity building, we need to do more case management as social worker, more funding for case management because it should be thorough and uh, improved social work to beneficiary ratio, then partnership with other organizations. Conclusion, my takeaways, uh, trauma and subsistence use are deeply interconnected, requiring integrated interventions, and uh, addressing GPV and substance use disorder together can break the cycles of violence and addiction. We also need to engage the young people because youth participation is pivotal in attaining evidence-based approaches and ensures sustainability. Uh, call, call to action, advocate for policies promoting trauma-informed care and systematic support, partnership for referral and support to do more, for example, undertaking psychosocial and economic youth-based activities. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Daisy, to hear what's actually being done to combat trauma, the work being done against gender-based violence from both you and Farheed is really, really important to understand and know that things are being done. And I know that we are, I'm running out of time here and there are some questions in the Q&A box. What we will do is um, I'm going to save the chat, save the Q&A, and then we will put those in the follow-up email and address those to the panelists. And thank you so much for taking the time, all the attendees, to sit here and listen to all of our presenters today. We're greatly appreciated. Um, and as we conclude, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of our esteemed panelists and to all of you who joined for this critical discussion. Your insights, questions, and engagement, engagement have highlighted the collective commitment needed to advance trauma-informed care worldwide and move the needle ending gender-based violence. Together, we can transform systems of care to be inclusive, respectful, and empowering for all. So this webinar is not the end, but the beginning of a unified effort. Let's carry this momentum forward into our workplaces, communities, advocacy, ensuring that trauma-informed care ending gender-based violence becomes a standard, not the exception. I encourage you to access a resource shared today and stay connected with WFAD's Global Gender Committee and the take bold steps in your fears of influence. Thank you so much for everybody for joining today, and we will send everything afterwards. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, so thank you Joanna. Thank you, to you all. Thank, thank you. you to the panelists. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Take you. Take care, everybody. Bye.